So one of the things that I like about doing this podcast with you is I get to introduce you to all kinds of movies that you've never seen before. And unless I'm wrong, this is your first ever Charles Bronson movie, yes? <laughs> yeah, I think it is my first ever Charles Bronson movie. Uh, I, I know kind of about Charles Bronson or seems um, familiar. I think I could like point out his picture in a line of mugshots if you wanted me to, but... I don't have any significant memory of any Charles Bronson movies. All right. Well, I'm about to blow your mind. I want you to look something up, okay? Google Robert Bronzy. Robert Bronzy. (laughs) This is insane. Right? Yeah. So what happened was Charles Bronson died, but basically someone was like, you know what I wish there was more of? Charles Bronson movies. So they just got a fucking lookalike dude and they just put him in movies. This is really weird. Were Bronson's movies that popular that they needed to keep making these? Like, who are they making these movies for? They're very popular, dude. Like, think about the Liam Neeson formula right now. Liam Neeson is in, like, 80 variations on Taken, and they've all done, like, reasonably well, I think, or at least good enough to keep making them. He is, like, this generation's Charles Bronson. Bronson made Death Wish, and then he just made a slew of movies where it's a one-man war on crime, and people just kept, like, funding them and going to see them or, like, renting them or whatever. And I don't blame them because they're pretty fucking fun. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i mean i wish i'd uh, this was death wish i'd like to see that i've never seen that oh, either that's, I think that's that too be... good for us because this podcast and welcome by the way is bad movies and beer i'm cooper i'm nolan and we are discussing noel's first ever charles bronson movie murphy's law is that why you chose this one is this uh sort of why it was uh because you wanted to introduce me to some charles bronson movies i was kind of curious of why we decided to watch this one i just think there is a whole array of charles bronson movies that we could watch for this this just seemed like an easy jumping in point because the thing about the bronson movies is he just kept making them and he got older and older he's 65 in this one (laughs) which is insane to be out here like acting like a tough guy leading man at 65 years old it raises some questions about his kind of like romantic interest that we'll get into later. But like, he's not as old as he would be in some of his later movies, which is insane to think about. But he's old enough where you're like, this is ridiculous. And that right there is a little bit of the magic of Charles Bronson. Uh, just because he, he carried on, he he sort of kept up the tough guy image, even though there's no way he could have done three quarters of the things that he did in this film. I still think he moves pretty good for a guy who's 65. Like, I will not be moving that well when I'm 65. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I hope to be moving as well as Charles is here, but uh, we'll see and and maybe try and I don't know. <laughs> I was going to make a comment about maybe going after the uh, the same age. of. Uh... <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> oh, no. But I don't actually really want that. So I uh, I reverse my comment. You don't want that yet. Let's get a couple of beers in you and you'll see what we say then. Uh, speaking of which, what are we <laughs> what are we drinking today? Oh, we have ourselves. A Murphy's Irish Stout, imported uh, from Ireland, obviously. It's uh, brewed in County Cork. Well, this is an actual Irish, like Irish stout, like made in Ireland. This is an actual made in Ireland Irish stout. It is available to us here uh, in Canada and Ontario because it's um, imported or sent over by Heineken. I guess they were purchased by Heineken sometime in the late 80s, early 90s. And they started sending them over all around the world to try to compete with Guinness's market share for stout. Ha! How did that work out for them? Not so good. <laughs> in fact, it went horribly. They created all kinds of marketing and all kinds of random things. In fact, they even made an anime uh, in an effort to try to... Yes, <laughs> they made an anime about it where uh, in the end, the sort of main character has to like get this stout to perform their kind of final move or whatever. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> I want to be very clear. We're not laughing at the fine folks at, uh, at Murphy's. We are laughing at uh, Heineken and their large conglomerate of brewers trying to make money off of this uh, seemingly very small once upon a time brewery. Yeah, it it seemed like it was a very um, community or sort of regional based stout. It's very popular in in Cork um, where it is brewed. Uh, where all of the Nolans are from, or where Nolan is a very common name. So fun for oh me. Oh my, look at uh, that. To, a little heritage pick here, maybe. One, yeah. Yeah, this is a bit of a heritage pick. We're gonna we're gonna give this a drink, uh, but I'm sure um, that it's something that I'm enjoy. I really enjoy stouts, so uh, I look forward to drinking this one uh, as we go through the podcast. I'm gonna crack it open. Yeah, let's do it. 
So, we open on our main character, Jack Murphy, played by Charles Bronson. He's walking down the street carrying a bag of groceries. We see kind of a young, punkish-looking girl who is looking at Jack a car that it turns out belongs to Charles Bronson. Uh, he sees her doing this, yells out at her that she can't steal his car. He's a cop. When she steals his car, what does he do with the bag of groceries he has? Well, he's got one move here. She's driving the car at him, so he throws the groceries at the car. It smashes into the windshield. Uh, he does kind of like, not an action hero dive, more of like an action hero fall <laughs> backwards onto the hood of a different car. I would describe it as a flop. This is what I'm expecting out of a 65-year-old action superstar. <laughs> it's very angry, yeah. But the, the part that killed me was the car is not even uh, close to hitting him. Like, he doesn't need to move out of the way at all, but he just fucking does it because it's supposed to be like an action piece. Whatever. It's hilarious. Then he gets up and he starts chasing her down. And I'm like, fuck, this guy is not going to chase down this car. We get a little help, I guess, because some of the groceries have kind of splattered in the windshield. So she can't see. So she drives the car, like, into a fucking pizza place, like, just right inside of a building. I mean, they have to do this for, the, like, setting the tone of the movie. You know this is going to happen. Uh, but it's such bullshit, right? Yeah, yeah. She would have put the windshield wipers on and would have driven easily away. Like, yeah, there's no chance that this little bit of grocery debris on her window is causing her to, after peeling out and driving down the street for like a block, crash through the window of a restaurant. At no point does she try to break or avoid this <laughs> restaurant. She's just right like through. right through the windows. And you're just like, oh, f***. And then, of course, she's okay, so she gets out and, and tries to leave on foot. But what fleet-footed 65-year-old here... Well, the crash has given Charles Bronson enough time to catch up to her. And he does. Uh, goes to arrest her, puts the cuffs on her. She's very mouthy. And she kind of says there's one thing about cops she's always wanted to know, which is, how come all cops have two-inch peckers? And then she knees him in the d- uh, this scene where he tracks her down is pretty funny, I think. He pulls out his gun and fires it in the air to tell her he's serious. Like, cops are just allowed to unload their guns into the air. Well, this cop's allowed to unload his gun wherever he wants, and we're going to see that in this shit. movie. Yeah, he he does not give a f- And then the mouthiness on her is really weird. Like, she's telling him off, but most of what she's saying is not swearing, and it's quite tame in its derogatory manner. It's, it's mouthy, but in kind of like a juvenile way. She says stuff like snot rag and monkey vomit and like toe jam. Like, it's not like she doesn't just call anybody a motherfucker or anything like that. Although later on, she gets into some very homophobic language, which, by the way, this movie is just rife with. It's really rough. Uh, both the police and all of the criminals in this drop a lot of homophobia. And it, it will come as a part of my feelings when we rate this movie later a little bit. Because it, it was right in the face and it just feels strange now that that was okay then for sure so she gets away though and the next morning charles bronson is uh woken up by a phone call and he looks fucking wasted why is every cop in like the 80s just a burnout drunk i don't understand i was groaning so hard right he gets woken up by the phone when he goes to reach for the phone there's a bottle of jack daniels which is three <laughs> quarters empty and a photo on the nightstand that he knocks off of a woman, right? Like, clearly they're telling you he's a drunk, and clearly they're telling you he no longer has this woman in his life. Like, they're just laying it all out here on the table. We do get about five, six minutes of uh, him kind of, like, putting himself together and getting ready. This has to be padding, because I'm like, why Why is this scene taking? We're getting his whole routine. He's f***ing getting dressed. He's trying to brush his teeth. He's looking at himself in the mirror. And sure enough, he picks up the picture, and we see it's he and what must be his wife in happier times. And right now, the music is doing the heavy lifting because it's like the heavy piano, and we're getting these long looks into the mirror. They just lay this on so fucking thick. Yeah, it's long. Um, you, you throw down the padding out here really quick. How long was this movie? About an hour 40. Okay. It felt way longer than that. Oh, oh no. <laughs> we'll get to our rating later, but holy shit. There are, um, yeah, there are a lot of scenes that don't really need to be in this, which we will mention very soon. The next thing we see is the crime scene where Charles Bronson's partner sees him and is alternating between lecturing him about his drinking and regaling him with tales of his wild sex life which uh, hungover shitbag Charles Bronson does not want to hear at whatever hour of the morning this is. Why are detectives always so crass? They're always just shitting on each other for being drunks and fucking people, right? Like, that's it, all it's it that, was. It's that kind of, like, 
that rote kind of paint by numbers like masculine yeah. role where it's like it's like locker room talk right where that's just the thing and that's these are men just of course they're talking about their sexual conquest and whatever else i guess they're just mailing in so much of the, the script writers building, right? yes yeah. oh my oh, yes. yeah they're oh, mailing God. the yeah. f- out of this thing yes they aren't okay. even trying to give these characters any nuance Unless you count Charles Bronson looking at himself in the mirror while the sad <laughs> piano music plays. Well, it's funny because as we go through the plot, it gets really convoluted. Like, it feels like they tried to spend a lot of time thinking about making the plot complicated, but put zero time into giving these characters any love. Yeah, that's true. It was all plot focus and not character focus. We've got a dead prostitute is what's happening. Charles Bronson recognizes her as one of Anthony Vincenzo's girls. We get the impression Vincenzo is some kind of gangster or mobster. So it's time to shake down somebody, but they don't know where to find him. So they go and ask his brother. Bronson and his partner shake him down at a nice restaurant, and they embarrass him in front of his mom. We work in the title very quickly, which you know I love when that happens. <laughs> this other Vincenzo brother reminds him about Murphy's Law. You know, anything that can go wrong will, which is sort of his implied threat of all the ways you might kill him. It is a funny threat. Uh, I like that he uses his name. What this made me think of was, did the name of the movie come first or did someone think of this line and concept? Like, okay, I've got it. We're going to make a movie around the idea of Murphy's Law. Oh, no, I think it's the next line. I think they got the idea for the next line, and they built the movie around that. This mobster threatens Charles Bronson by mentioning Murphy's Law, and then he tells him Jack Murphy's Law. The only law I know is Jack Murphy's Law. That's very simple. Don't f*** with Jack Murphy. (laughs) <laughs> that's the one yeah that's the yeah. one where they built the script around that i did laugh when he delivered that line right i did that's I did a great enjoy that. line you can and tell we revisit it later bronson's done this a lot well he's that's the thing he's one of the first guys who i can think of who was really dropping in one-liners like schwarzenegger became the master of this in the like 80s 90s uh but bronson was doing it in like the 70s right like he'd get in there and he'd just have a quick little put the button on it with a line he's great at it and he has a few good ones in this From there, we cut to a kind of grizzled-looking woman. Like, I don't mean to criticize this lady's appearance, but she's kind of weathered. (laughs) Uh, Like, she's an older... She looks like she's been through some things. Yeah. Definitely. She's getting off a bus, and she makes a phone call to a Mr. Cameron. Turns out he's a private investigator, and she wanted him to track down some names. He did, but when he goes to deliver them to her, he tries to shake her down for more money. And this does not go well for him. Uh, no... You sort of feel for the woman at first as this private investigator is trying to f*** her over. But very quickly after he does this, she gets the upper hand by pulling a gun on him and asking him to do what? Oh, yeah. She tells him to say, ah, like he's at the dentist. Then she blows a hole through the back of his head. Yeah. She has this really sort of strange smile or they're sort of giving you a sense here that we've got a pretty f***. Up person on her hands. Yeah, this is the scene that's designed to kind of make us first realize, like, oh, she's crazy. From there, we see Jack Murphy returning home with groceries. This is his second attempt to bring groceries home. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. he failed the first time. He sure did. He opens his mailbox, and in there he finds a final decree of divorce. So again, we got a special delivery. It's backstory. They're just giving us more details on his tragic life here. They're letting us know what's happening with that photo. They are not (laughs) leaving anything to the imagination here. No, they're 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 connecting the dots for us. They're doing all the heavy lifting for us. This is nice of them. (laughs) (laughs) I guess it is. He gets a phone call the second he gets in the door. It's from the woman that we just saw, who confirms who she's talking to, and then says she's going to kill him. But first, she's going to put him through hell. So again, speaking of them doing all the uh, heavy lifting for us and connecting those dots, they're just telling us what's up. They're even telling him. He doesn't even seem to like care about this very much. Like He doesn't really take it to heart so much. He just sort of goes back to dealing with the other shit that was happening in his life. He like, or I, In fact, he just gets f***ing drunk. Well, of course, that's his nighttime ritual. But if some random person calls you and tells you they're going to murder you and make your life miserable, you're just going to f***ing, okay, I'm going to just get hammered. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a creature of habit. To your point, though, the next day he comes out of his house looking like shit again. And he doesn't really, he's not even like looking around. He isn't like too concerned that anyone might be watching him. Which, by the way, that woman's there watching him. She's <laughs> taking photos. Bronson gets to the station as soon as he does. One of the other cops starts making some remarks about how he looks like shit, which, again, is accurate. He does. He looks pretty terrible. 
But then the cop tells him that he saw his ex-wife stripping and asked Charles Bronson if her tits taste as good as they look. Ooh. I thought this was just cops being dicks to other cops. Like when, when he says this to him, for some reason, I just I didn't imagine that Bronson's wife was a topless dancer. Oh, no, but it turns out that she actually is. Yeah, no, That's she what, is. Yeah, yeah when, once we get into this later, I was like, I completely blew this off. I was like, that's just a guy being an asshole, right? Like, I, I didn't take any heart at all to what he said. But, uh, no, clearly that's true. And, and Bronson was not good with being told that. So he punches him out. And who comes to yell and break all this up? Well, and I told you this is going to happen. Because when we were talking <laughs> about how he's a burnout this. drunk, I'm like, I yeah. guarantee you at some point the chief's going to yell at him because that's another 80s cop movie trope. And they do. They break it up. The chief breaks Murphy in his office, yells at him, tells him to get his f***ing life together. When Murphy emerges from the chief's office, they've gotten a tip that the Vincenzo brother they're looking for, Anthony Vincenzo, is going to be catching a flight out of town that day. So they race to the airport, and this is where we get probably the like best in the sense of being unintentionally hilarious, but maybe the worst <laughs> in the sense of actual like acting uh. scene in this whole f***ing movie. This airport shootout is gloriously awful it's pretty hilarious yeah he finds out that he's heading to vegas and they're gonna they're gonna stop him there um he's a pretty hilarious caricature of uh, an italian mobster the fucking hair on this guy my god it's oh incredible. my goodness he's carrying a suitcase which once he sees the police he opens and it has a typewriter inside but then he opens the typewriter and inside that is a gun <laughs> So he pulls the gun out of the inside of his typewriter <laughs> and he grabs a hostage. He grabs a, a flight attendant and a guard tries to stop him in what is maybe the worst delivered line of this movie. And that's saying a lot. The guard shouts freeze. One word line and he can't quite nail it. No. It's uh, really bad. It's it's awful. I, I don't even I wish I could describe how poorly he the actor does this. Well it's not just the line, it's also his facial expression. His facial expression he's just a terrible actor, is what it is. It it seems like he was sort of he knew that he was about to get blown away because it was in the script and he was already acting out the getting shot as he was saying freeze. It was just <laughs> so brutal. <laughs> he was like already going down and like holding his chest and making pain faces as he yelled freeze because that gun goes off and he gets murdered and we see the mobster run away uh, with the flight attendant in tow. Right, but he also kills her, right? Yeah, well, as he's getting chased, he decides, well, I can't drag you any longer and he just blows her away. So now... And who catches up to him? Well, of course. It's, listen, if Jack Murphy can chase down a car, Jack Murphy can chase down some mulleted mobster dragging a hostage behind him. Can't save that hostage. Well, no, of course not. But when the guy turns around, Jack Murphy shoots him through a glass door he falls backward of course there's a glass door there all the glass shatters and that dude is dead before he hits the ground he lands on the ground and he's just fucking dead like it's just over it's like a switch going off yeah it blows away this mobster i mean the mobster did murder two people in there uh so i guess understandably so and he was about to turn and shoot at him but just blows him away and that's not going to go over well with the mobster's family is it no, I was going to say, don't try telling his family that he deserved to get shot. We get a brief funeral clip where the Vincenzo mother tells the surviving brother that she wants Jack Murphy dead. And uh, I bet he wishes he was dead in the next scene <laughs> because we see him in the strip club where his ex-wife is stripping. And this is what rock bottom looks like. Oh, actually, I was wrong. Uh, because when she finishes dancing, she comes to the table. She tells him that she's now living with the strip club manager. So I guess this is actually rock bottom. <laughs> yeah, this is both scenes are are pretty strange. I I don't really get what we're trying to feel for him. We he's at a strip club of his ex wife watching her dance for strangers. Like who does that to themselves? Great question. And then when she actually comes and like I don't know why she even gives him a second of her time, just basically lectures around what is she doing here? He's gonna like nag her out of being a stripper and coming back to him. That's not gonna fucking happen. And then he tails her home. He follows her and her new boyfriend back to their new home, and he's, like, watching them. Every time I think that Charles Bronson has hit rock bottom in this movie, he, like, digs out a deeper bottom and then hits that one. <laughs> Unfortunately, not only has he been tailing them, but the mysterious woman 
has also been tailing him. So now she has seen him watching this woman. She has seen where the woman lives. And I am guessing that's probably going to end badly. Yeah, she said she was going to make him hurt. So one of the ways to get to him is to try to break his heart, right? We're going to see how that goes. Yep. Well, the next day, Jack Murphy, as part of his daily routine, is going to buy more alcohol. (laughs) And in the store, he sees a familiar face. It's that girl who tried to jack his car. He chases her into the ladies' room, arrests her, and this is where we learn her name. It's Arabella. And uh, to celebrate catching her, finally, Bronson goes back to the strip club to insult his ex-wife some more. God (laughs) damn it. I want to go back to the Arabella character here. She is in almost the, the very first scene, right? And then she's back again as he's buying alcohol. She's got this really immature kind of anti-cop stance. Not like it it, just the things she says are really immature, except for her homophobia. And I'm really questioning why she's even in this movie. Clearly, as we watch through it, I get a better understanding. But I'm so confused about her role here. We will get answers to that very soon. But in the meantime, he goes back to the strip club. This is a bad idea for several reasons, but a big one is that the mysterious woman is waiting for him in his car, and when he goes back there, she knocks him out, drives the car to his ex-wife's house, shoots her and her new boyfriend with his gun, and we've got ourselves a frame job. Yeah, um, if you keep going back to the well long enough, something bad's going to happen. Right, he, he needed to stay away from there. He knew that there was someone out trying to f*** with him. He also knew that mobsters were pretty mad at him, yet he went out to this public place. So not good choices. Um, after she does this murder and sort of drives his car or drives him back to his house and leaves him there, we get a, a shot of her from inside the car through a windshield, and she gives this really creepy smile. I actually thought that that was pretty well done, both the shot and, and the way that she appeared there. Like it, Her character is really messed up, and they're doing a really good job of portraying what would be a very sort of intimidating or scary revenge story with her. And not just that, uh, just you, you just made me think of this too, but the fact that she is a woman, mm-hmm. how many movies of this have a female character that is the one kind of like driving the plot in this way and being being sort of like the big villain at the end. Like that's that's kind of a surprise, kind of a, a strange for the times as well. Yeah, no, and I think that that's definitely a, a plus. I like that part of this movie, and I thought that her character was pretty creatively acted and written, I guess. I don't know about acted, but creatively written. <laughs> okay, that's kind of... <laughs> Kind of some half praise there. Yeah, a little bit Um, of sideways half praise, you know. And you know what? Part of her master plan has worked because there was an eyewitness. He gets the description of the car. They immediately know it's Bronson's car. And Charles Bronson wakes up with a bad headache and then immediately gets arrested. He tries to tell them that he was framed. But they play hardball during the interrogation. This, of course, angers him. He responds with more of this 80s era homophobia. But they're the ones laughing last because ballistics come back and confirms that both of the people were killed with Charles Bronson's gun. So he's going to jail. Yeah, it's not looking good, right? The evidence is pointing his way. We've got witnesses. We've got the bullet evidence. Even his defense lawyer tells him to pretty much just uh, admit it. And we're going to say you were too drunk to know what you were doing. And maybe you only, you're only you going to get sentenced to eight and you're going to do three. Just Just let it happen. Good line here, too, because Charles Bronson says to him, Did it ever cross your mind that I'm innocent? Frankly, no. (laughs) (laughs) It doesn't look good, right? Uh, Oh, my, no, no, definitely not. that this sort of lead antagonist, the evil character here, is doing a good job of setting up uh, Charles Bronson to take the fall. Definitely. So he does, in fact, get put in jail, or at least a holding jail until his trial. You'll never guess who's in there. It's his carjacking friend, Arabella, who he immediately gets handcuffed to. She takes the opportunity to taunt him. He responds with some more homophobia, implying that she might enjoy the company of other women. She attacks him, which creates the perfect opportunity. And that is why she's in this movie. Because you need a way for him to get out of police custody. And her attacking him is that way. <laughs> it's so strange, right? We, we are in a like thriller detective movie. And we're about to transition to a buddy cop movie. Almost. Like a it's mismatch so weird, like buddy right? comedy? Like, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's so strange that we're about to like have that thriller turn into the relationship of these two trying to escape from jail together. Yeah, we're actually going to get about three or four rapid like movie genre tonal shifts in, a, in the next like 10 minutes. The guards enter to try and break up their fight. 
and this allows Jack Murphy to grab one of the guards' guns, and now they're breaking out of jail. Like you said, we're kind of shifting here to like a mismatched buddy comedy. There's kind of like some back and forth where she can't believe they're escaping, and she calls him more names, and he calls her more names, and they steal a helicopter? <laughs> yeah, so uh, this escape is pretty brutal. Uh, the police seem pretty inept in it. Uh, I'm I'm really confused here why he doesn't take the keys uh, and unlock himself from Arabella as they are about to try to escape. Uh, he's stolen a gun, but not the keys, which doesn't make sense. But I guess that would ruin our buddy comedy. They escape from the immediate holding cell, and instead of trying to go out the front doors, he's smart. He knows he needs to head up. We get the impression that he has maybe flown a helicopter as he was in the military, maybe, because he says he hasn't flown a helicopter in I don't know how many years, he says, but it's a long number of years. He dropped, like, it was a couple decades since he'd flown a copter, and this did not make our female character very happy, but he says, or he seems fairly confident, and he does do that daring escape with a helicopter. Yeah, they're off. The, a couple of cops shoot at it, which turns out to be a problem for them. Once they're up in the air, we get just some really bad comedy from Arabella. She doesn't like heights, you see, and she might be sick, and she goes to open the door to throw up, but then she sees how high up she is, and I'm just like, come on, guys, this is pretty brutal. Then they run out of fuel. (laughs) It was so bad. I don't understand why it had such little fuel. It felt like they were in the air for a minute and a half. I got the impression that when the cops shot it, it like put a bullet hole in the in the fuel thing. We didn't see a shot of it like spilling out like you see sometimes in movies. I did not get that even a little bit, but maybe that is what we were supposed to infer. Or maybe they were fueling it up at the time that he grabbed it. I don't know. Either way, they're out of fuel. And then where do they where do they go to or where do they land as they're trying to escape with this uh, out of fuel? Or out of gas helicopter. Yeah, so this story, I guess, is taking place in California. And so they kind of fly towards the California countryside, and he emergency lands the helicopter on a barn, an old barn. Unfortunately, the barn is too old because it immediately collapses, and three guys run in who are very well armed, like surprisingly well armed. Yeah, this is really strange. So right as they land on the roof, we get some really poor lines from the two of them as their banter continues. It's here that like her lines seem super off tone or they just don't make sense to me as we're going through. And then they fall through and you're right. There are three guys with an incredible arsenal staring at them, pointed at them right as they crash to the ground. Yeah, see, it turns out this is a grow operation. That's why the barn's here. They're growing marijuana or as she calls it, <laughs> yeah, she dropped a weird like marijuana. Yeah. And she she said she wants to get high with them right away. Yeah, well that's the good news. The good news is these guys are not going to call the cops. But the bad news is they are going to try to have their way with Arabella. Now Jack Murphy tries to fight them off, but he gets knocked out. Luckily though, he wakes up from this just in time to save her. They escape from the barn, steal these guys' car. And just in case they were going to pursue them, Charles Bronson uh, blows up their three motorcycles uh, at the same time by shooting one of them. He shoots one of the motorcycles. All three blow up at the same time. (laughs) I've raged about this in other movies before. You know this drives me insane. I was upset. I was yelling at the screen when this happened. Like, this is an instant negative one but that's another 80s movie trope man we've seen that before it just happens but i hate it i hate it this is an 80s trope that i am not okay with it makes me so mad that's fair from here we are going to travel to the cabin of one of murphy's old cop buddies ben once they get to this cabin they're really building on this strange relationship between arabella and um, our friend murphy here First of all, they get inside and Murphy passes out on top of her. His injuries, he's sort of succumbed to getting hit in the head and the other injuries he's received. And we get this like two minute effort of her crawling out from under him and dragging his ass across the floor until she finds something to pick the lock of their handcuffs with. And she does this incredibly easily. Like, if they wanted to be a part earlier in this sort of movie, they could have been so fast. But that would have sort of killed what is going to become a strangely romantic breakfast that they have. Yeah, it's weird. She makes some food for him, but then she's not a very good cook because she's young and has probably not cooked a lot. He makes a comment about how shitty the food looks. She throws it at him and stomps out. She also criticized his drinking. And when this happens, Ben kind of gives him some advice about how he was a fool to just let her walk out of here. And, you know, he's being a real idiot. And this is where I'm really like, what? what is the nature of this relationship? Is Ben telling him that he should try to date this girl? Like, what is this? That's kind of what they're starting to imply. And it's really confusing. It doesn't seem like very likely at all. 
right? We've got this grizzled old police officer and this young thief, like car thief, pickpocket kind of person. And you're like, here, here we go. Here's the budding, loving relationship that we all know is going to come to fruition. It probably doesn't help that they have like zero chemistry with each other, like not even a little bit of chemistry. No, neither of them exude any kind of sort of chemistry anyone can pick up on. Like watching it, I, w- I didn't care about either of them. Oh, wow. That's pretty harsh on Jack Murphy. You guys trying to put his life back together. Come on. Uh, unfortunately, in the classic Charles Bronson curse, anyone he comes in contact with is immediately doomed. See, uh, this mysterious woman has also seen Ben before and figured out where he lives. So, like, the second that uh, Murphy and Arabella leave, she's there to murder Ben. And this is where we get another massive tonal shift. It essentially becomes a horror movie for the next five minutes. Yeah, this is really strange. We get the sort of first-person shots from the perspective of the killer woman. Doing the horror thing where she's looking through trees and the future victim is kind of looking around and suspects something but doesn't see what's coming after them. And that happens for quite a long time until we finally get the murder scene where she takes him down with his own shotgun. Which is almost a bit of a jump scare. Like we've got this kind of horror music in the background also. It is very much a scene that's very out of place with the rest of this movie. And yes, she shotguns Ben. So now there's a second death. And this kills me. Bronson is driving away. He sees Arabella walking down the road, convinces her to get in the car, even though, like, realistically, being with him would be one of the least safe places for her, right? Like, he knows that there's, or he thinks there's a mob out to try and kill him. Um, He knows the cops are after him. Why would he be, like, get in this car? Isn't she better off on her own? It is true. It's weird. I don't understand why he wanted her back in there so bad. I guess he was just offering to drive her back to the city. But it it did seem really strange. If he was really paying attention to what was happening to everyone around him, he should have been telling her to run away. Yeah, exactly. Hitchhike somewhere else. Go the opposite direction. Get out of the state. Something. But no, she gets back in the car. Later on, she makes him stop for food. And when they stop, she sees a newspaper headline about Ben's death and how it is once again being blamed on Jack Murphy. Now, they just left his place a few hours ago. And then the woman showed up and killed him. And then uh, it's nighttime. So this must be the same day. When did this fucking newspaper get printed? There's no fucking way. <laughs> this you don't is... get a newspaper right now. It'd be like the next morning at best. Uh... What the f- Yeah, this is the fastest printing of a full-size paper that's ever happened, right? I mean, it helps feed us what's happening in the story and moving it along as we go. But yeah, that one that one seemed like a continuity mistake. We know our canon friends are not the best in that. Yeah, we didn't mention, but this is another fine film from the folks at the Canon Films Company. I love it. From there, we cut to the real person behind the frame job. She's there trying on some wigs. Turns out that she is heading to a fancy restaurant hoping to meet and entrap another person on her list. Now, she does because he notices her from across the restaurant, and she ends up drowning him in his bathtub. But I was so preoccupied in this scene with this fucking bathtub. This is like a walk-in bathtub, almost like a soaking tub, but like in an old, like, fucking gym. It's got, like, this really tiled wall. I didn't know what this was. What was this bathtub? It was really weird. It was not something that we would experience in a a regular, uh, like, house or apartment-style place. It was definitely a large, fully tiled room that you walk downstairs into where all of the water pooled. Looked like it had lots of jets and stuff. I, I felt like it was a really old hotel or something like that where they had this kind of thing going on. Maybe. I was too busy focused on that to pay much attention to her murdering him. But she does. From there, Murphy and Arabella go to see Vincenzo. But there's some cops that are guarding the lobby of his apartment building. Arabella goes in there and tells the cops that she's got a flat tire. And one of the cops is just immediately completely seduced by her. He's putting his hands on her. He tells his partner, hey, why don't you go take care of that, Jack? And I'll stay in here. And there's like sexual overtones. And I'm like, wait, what? Where did this come from? They do not give much credit to men at all in this situation, right? Like as soon as there's a woman in this movie who shows any sort of interest in any man, they immediately follow her or are attracted to her. But that's the thing. She doesn't even show any interest in this guy. She just says she has a flat tire and like maybe makes eye contact with him and he is just all in. It is like immediate. It makes no sense. Yep. So this was all a setup to get them into the penthouse where the other Vincenzo brother is and he's there watching porn and like maybe getting a (laughs) 
up, but it's not totally clear. It's it's really strange. He's definitely got a woman who is around his groin area, but she seems to be sort of kissing his stomach rather than filleting him. Yeah, she seems too high up. He keeps sort of in a weird, like, sexual way yelling, Do it. Do it now. <laughs> And you're just like, oh my god, what is happening here? Yeah, but that would lend credence to your idea that she isn't actually bleeping him. That maybe she's like teasing him. Uh, or yeah, something. I think it felt like a tease. And then, but does she get to uh, to end that tease? No. Jack Murphy breaks up that party and at gunpoint tries to get Vincenzo to tell him who frames him for his ex-wife's murder. But Vincenzo doesn't actually know. So out of ideas. Bronson and Arabella go to see Charles Bronson's old partner. Now, this is actually a really smart move, I feel. He asks for a list of all the homicide cases that he and Ben worked together, and maybe he can make something happen from that. That's a pretty clever idea, I feel. From there, we get another Vincenzo scene where he is offering 10 grand to anyone who can get Murphy. And speaking of trying to get Murphy, that's what uh, Arabella is maybe trying to do. She, like, watches him shave in this oddly sensual way. It's a really strange scene. Yeah, I just wrote, what the f*** is this? Like, I was really confused. He's shaving, and she comes in and just kind of watches him. And then he's kind of like, what the f*** are you doing? And she's like, nothing. Like, f*** you, too. It's weird that they're sort of relationships built on just cursing each other out. Well, we see that again in a second because they have like a minute long argument over sandwiches and how the right way to make a sandwich. And he doesn't like mayonnaise. And she's like, how can you have a sandwich without mayonnaise? And and it's Charles Bronson voice is just like, I don't like mayonnaise. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they bond over like mayonnaise or no mayonnaise on sandwiches. And you're like, this is where this relationship's coming from. Again, we're being told that it's starting to build because we have the music in the background doing all of the heavy lifting, as you've said earlier in this movie. Oh, the music's so romantic. And at this point, she basically puts the full court press on him. He tells her that he's too old for her, and she says she likes him older. And then, after asking if it's true that cops' guns are a substitute for their wangs... (laughs) Those were her words. Yeah, she asked Wayne. them that. And then she asked no, she, them she asked them to prove, prove it. yeah. that it's not. Yeah. She just wants him to bang her, apparently. Yeah, man. Well, thank God a phone call breaks this up. It's Charles Bronson's partner, and he's got three names for him. Now the last name on the list, Joan Freeman, that kind of makes things click for Murphy because he remembers that and he sees a newspaper headline about the judge on her trial who has just been murdered also i guess that was the guy from the bathtub mhm i guess it says suicide in the uh in the newspaper but he knows it's not a suicide oh yeah too big a coincidence now that he's got this he just hangs up the phone immediately and i was like man how about a fucking thank you for your partner here who just you know had to fucking go he had and, to break uh, into the computer system to yeah. give you the info which would have been helpful how about just telling him so we can help you not fucking die yeah that's a great point because that comes right? up later. Like, yeah. How about just give him all the info right now so that he can help you stay alive and maybe capture this woman who is trying to seek revenge on you and everyone else who was involved in putting her in jail? Yeah, I, uh, you're right. And that does come up later on very soon. We get a quick scene of the killer, Joan Freeman, lifting weights and murdering her parole officer for some reason. And then Bronson and Arabella go to her hotel to find her. First, Charles Bronson has to strong arm the desk clerk, who, upon recognizing them, calls the police. Now, the cops come. They shoot at Bronson right away, not even a freeze. And it is shoot first. And we've got a chase scene, but it's real short. Uh, Bronson slows them down by shooting their car with his tiny gun. And, of course, there's a giant explosion, which must have just driven you crazy. I was just so angry. Um, (laughs) He's so far away from the car. I think he fires maybe two, three shots maximum, and the car explodes. So there's no chance they're chasing. He shoots it in the back of the car, too. He, like, shoots it in the trunk and maybe the rear windshield, and the thing explodes. It's baffling why we thought that was a good idea in 80s cinema. Like, I I guess the explosion's fun. Like, someone's just like, I want to f***ing blow something up. But it just does not hold up at all. No, it's ludicrous. But before the cops got there, Charles Bronson found an address. It was an address for a place in Malibu. And it's the address of the prosecuting attorney in her trial. So they know where they have to go. They race over there. For some reason, when they get in this guy's giant house, they decide to split up, which is just a terrible idea because I'm pretty sure Arabella doesn't have a gun or any kind of weapon. We know this is a horror movie. We saw the shots of it earlier. There's no way you're supposed to split up, right? (laughs) That's the only reason that it's going to happen, right? Because every horror movie, people decide they're going to split up. Oh, yeah. And right away, Freeman grabs Arabella. She's got a rag soaked in ether and gets her. By the time Murphy figures this out, he's found the dead body of the prosecutor. 
she's left him a note that says, waiting for you where it all started. So we're heading for the final act here. Yeah, we're, we're about getting towards the end. We Is it after this we sort of learn the background information that he had arrested her after she freaked out and killed her boyfriend at a theater, I think? Um, I think so, because... Charles Bronson knows the place where she's headed, and so he calls the police for backup. And I think this is where he explains that that's what's going on. Unfortunately, in the rare stroke of bad luck for Jack Murphy, who up until now his life has been a blessed charm, <laughs> the guy who answers the phone is his like enemy at the police station, that cop who they got in the fight with earlier. Yeah, the guy who one punched. And yeah, I wouldn't hold my breath for that backup there, Jack Murphy. Either way, he heads to the building, and this building is, like, pretty terrifying. This is a great location for a final showdown. Yeah, this is a really cool set piece. Um, I was criticizing their character development in here because it was so plot-focused, but a couple of the locations of the things that have happened have been pretty cool, and this is maybe the best location out of the entire filming. In this terrifying space, hiding is... Joan Freeman with a crossbow. We're taking things up a notch here with this weaponry. Yeah, it's funny. We come into this building and immediately they show us a what looks like a setup for like an archery a, target, like a bullseye. Yeah, there's an archery target. And there's a, a some arrows already in it, and you're like, well, what was going on here at this interesting place or theater? They're trying to show us something's happened. We also see Arabella tied up and trying to call for help. Yes, Jack Murphy is there. He's in the building. And his enemy from the police station shows up, but he's alone. He hasn't told anyone about this. Well, that's not exactly true. He did tell Vincenzo, who's there with a couple of goons. Turns out this cop is making a dirty play. And as soon as he gets inside the building, he pulls his gun on Jack Murphy and reveals his true colors. Of course, he is a dirty cop, right? The one that he punched out because we know that we should always have been on Jack Murphy's side. There you go. See, just to drive home the fact that this guy's a dick, if he turns to be evil too. But the thing is, uh, Joan Freeman, she's not about to let anyone steal her moment. So she crossbows this dude right in the fucking neck, just <laughs> drops him. Yeah, he goes down fast. Like, it's it's a pretty quick and clean kill. She seems like she's quite skilled with a, a crossbow. I'm not sure where she got her training, but she takes him down really neatly. Oh, yeah. And then she tells Jack Murphy to come and get her. And he does, but very slowly because she starts shooting arrows at him. And in the process of this, he is unable to get his gun, which he was forced to drop when the dirty cop showed up. So now he's unarmed. Now Vincenzo and his goons getting impatient, they decide to enter the building themselves. Murphy gets the drop on one of them fairly quickly, grabs his gun, and then uses an old elevator to escape the other one. <laughs> it's like almost like a it's like a low speed chase to the top. The guy's running up the stairs and every so often he thinks he's on the level that Murphy's at, but the elevator keeps going up. It's kind of funny. I guess so. I don't think it's meant to be funny, though. I think it's meant to be kind of suspenseful. But the sort of speed of the running up and down these stairs and the speed of that elevator make for some what are supposed to be tense, but almost but become laughable moments, I'd say. Oh, definitely. Now, Jack Murphy manages to get the drop on this guy. But to do this, he has to like dive through a window that would have severed every artery in his legs. It's it's brutal. The way he dives through this. Yeah, and when he's diving through the window, it's clearly not him. The stunt no. double is so <laughs> no. real. They don't even look like the same shape body, right? So no. we're just like, oh my goodness, budget, 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 because it is not believable at all that 65-year-old Charles Bronson would dive through this glass window to take out this other guy. No, and as if to hammer home the point of how unlikely it is that he would not have sustained some damage, in like a minute later, he pushes the guy back towards the window and a giant piece of glass stabs through this guy's neck, killing him, which like that would have happened to Bronson's legs. He'd be lying there on the ground with like both arteries severed. No chance. Ah, it's fine. So <laughs> at this point, Vincenzo is the next one to charge him. He's got like an Uzi and it looks like he kind of clips Charles Bronson when he's shooting at him. He certainly thinks so because he finds a body on the ground, which he is convinced is Charles Bronson and starts shooting that body. And this is where we get back to that fucking line again from earlier. <laughs> out of the shadows, out of the shadows, after he drops the Murphy's Law line on a corpse that is not our Jack Murphy. Yeah, Jack Murphy steps out and says, remember what I told you, 
don't f*** with Jack Murphy. And he f***ing blows him out of the water. So this is the scene that this whole movie was based around, right? Here's my thought on this, because I actually forgot, because I've seen this movie like a long time ago. It's been a long time. And I thought this actually was the last line of the movie. I thought this was Bronson's big f***ing button he puts on it. But that's not true. Mm -mm. So I'm thinking maybe maybe when the screenwriters wrote this, maybe they were like, this is going to be our big line. But then in a couple minutes, it was like, wait, we can squeeze one more in here. Because now, now we're down to Jack Murphy and Joan Freeman one-on-one yeah so he's got to go save um arabella right we know that she's there and she's in trouble and we also know that he's got to stop joan because she's putting on quite a show here yeah and at some point she's managed to like trap arabella at the bottom of the elevator and the elevator is gonna like crush her so now he has to fucking run down all the stairs and try and save her this is bullshit <laughs> he's worked his way all the way up these stairs he's ridden an elevator up and he has confronted Joan. But when he gets there, she laughs in his face and tells him, like, your girlfriend, which is really weird, by the way. I don't understand where their relationship come from. She is tied at the bottom of this elevator shaft. How, though? Because he rode the elevator up. Was she at the bottom the whole time? Like, he just didn't see her at the bottom? Yeah, so it doesn't make sense. It also doesn't make sense for a 65-year-old man who's been shot and through all of these fights, jumped through a plate glass window. All of these things to run down the stairs and in time rescue her. This scene felt like it was, I don't know, 45 minutes for me. Oh, him wow. running down the stairs and pulling her out of here. I, I was groaning and waiting for this to be over. Well, he makes it, though. He makes it to the bottom of those stairs and he gets her out of there. But then, in just another cruel twist, from way up above... Joan Freeman with the crossbow puts one right through Arabella's back and we get the dramatic Charles Bronson yelling no <laughs> yeah that no is pretty special he uh he had practiced that one I think in most of this movie they probably only did one take uh for most of the line <laughs> it's delivery the canon film's way I have um, to assume but this one I'm I'm pretty sure that they went through and did quite a few until they nailed it because it was it was well delivered she has uh, Freeman, our sort of villainous, really trying to make Bronson hate her as much as she hates him. And, and it's working. Yeah, I think she even says that to him, right? Like, do you hate me much as I hate you? He's fucking after her now. But she comes at him with an axe. She tries to give him a scat man. Yeah, and <laughs> for a second you think he's going to take it. He doesn't even get sliced in the gut. Yeah, but then, and this is where, my God, you're talking about a 65-year-old man running the stairs? The move he pulls off here is just unbelievable. He throws her down one of the small flights of stairs. She gets up, and then, while, like, holding his intestines in his stomach, runs, jumps, does, like, a flying drop kick that sends her back over the railing, which I just, like, fucking burst out laughing because in no way, shape, or form should he be able He lands on his fucking feet, which is absurd. Like, there's no fucking way. Yeah, there's been a lot of unbelievable shit in this movie, and this is the most unbelievable moment of the entire thing. It's clearly not him jumping while holding in their intestines or their stomach and landing on their feet after two, like, feet flying, kicking her in the chest. And then she flies over, but does she just go sailing to her death? No, f no. Luckily, the axe that she was holding like wedges itself in between the railing and she's able to grab the axe handle, but she is just holding on. Now I'm watching her as she's holding on and I'm like, okay, here's the move. There's another stairwell right underneath you. There's like a landing there. If she swings her legs and just like lets go with some forward momentum, she will land on that fucking landing and be totally fine. But instead she just slowly starts slipping down the axe handle, asking Jack Murphy to help her. Uh, no dice on that. He's not going to do it. And when she realizes, this is where we get our big end line. This is great. She says to him, You got Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, man. That's good uh, shit. That's good shit. <laughs> that, that line or that delivery was pretty good. And then, of course, she slips and falls to her death. Yeah. And uh, from there, we get Jack Murphy being loaded into an ambulance. And wouldn't you know who's in there? Still alive. It's Arabella, and she starts kind of mouthing off at him. He threatens that he's going to wash her mouth out with soap all the way to the other end of her body. So I guess he is up for a romantic relationship. <laughs> it sounds like it. And as they drive off into the sunset in that ambulance together, for the very first time in the movie, we get a song with lyrics. Oh, yes. And that song played over the end credits. It has to be titled, I haven't looked it up, but it has to be titled Murphy's Law because it is the theme song of this movie where they sing about Murphy's Law and like basically the chorus is just telling you that whatever can go wrong will go wrong. 
Murphy's Law. And I'm just like, what is this fucking song? <laughs> it was so bad. It was just so, so bad. It made me think back to some of the worst songs in The Last Dragon. Sort of our Motown um, promotion for Motown songs. And this is way worse than any piece of shit in that. Like, it was the worst song or one of the worst songs we've ever heard in a movie by far. Well, I mean, lyrically, it's just atrocious. And they try, I, I give them credit, they try to, like, kind of spice it up by putting some saxophone in there, like some hi hat symbol but no it's just not happening it's uh it's real bad and that's it man that's the movie uh that's how it ends so we've reached the point where we're going to rate this now in case you've never heard us before why you picked this episode i'll never know but we (laughs) we (laughs) we rate these uh two times on a scale of one to ten we do it twice one to ten for how bad it is one to ten for how enjoyable it is and our goal is to find movies that get it a 10 out of 10 on both categories, as we call it the Crit, crit 20. 20, 20, 20. I will start us off for how bad this movie is. I'm close, but I can't quite get all the way there. The thing is, again, as a Charles Bronson fan, a couple of those one-liners, really strong. And I give them a lot of points for the location of the last scene, the climax. It's a great location. I thought other than a couple of things that are a little ridiculous in terms of his physicality, Good job kind of like building suspense, building some tension. The soundtrack steered us wrong in a couple places, but I do think the beginning and a couple other points of the movie, those guitar solos are cranking out. It's propelling the action forward. I'm going to say it's nine bad because there's a lot wrong here, but I'm not going to say it's a 10. What about you? <laughs> I had a nine bad too. Okay. I thought you were going to go less bad than that, to be honest. I thought uh, by the way you're speaking about it, it wasn't going to go there. Um, there's so many things that I thought were bad about this movie. I really disliked the music. The final song was oh, hang just on now. atrocious. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, yes. That's real bad. Um, yes. Yes, I agree. The line delivery in a lot of places was awful. It felt one take all the time. Um, the editing at times to the story uh, in so many unnecessary tropes. The switching of tones and genre. The, like, really over-the-top homophobia. And then, of course, guns blowing up cars and motorcycles in one <laughs> shot. It, it, it was a nine all over the board for me. I did actually like the female villain character okay. and the idea behind that. I thought that, that she was well executed. And I did think that Bronson did what he was supposed to um, in terms of how it was written for him and what it was, even if that, to me, wasn't uh, a movie I would choose to make or watch. That's what you, oh, so this <laughs> is not guess. one you're going to watch again then, I gather. Oh, oh, oh well, we're going to get well, to enjoy yeah, Let's guess, segue right? there right gonna... now. How enjoyable on a scale of 1 to 10 did you find this movie? Uh, I give it a 6. Ooh, that's pretty low. Yeah, I gave it a 6 in enjoyability. Um, I laughed at some of the absurdity uh, in it, and there was some of it. I actually kind of felt that the attempt at making a plot that had a lot of depth was kind of interesting. Oh. It was kind of strange that they added both the mafia and the other part. Like, it was ridiculous, but it was so ridiculous that it was kind of fun. Why I didn't enjoy it more, um, I did find it slow. I felt there was a lot of unnecessary scenes. The music, to me, was driving too much of the story, and I didn't really care about the characters at all. I, I didn't care if our character Arabella like was done at the end or wasn't there I was annoyed that she was alive at the end (laughs) and that they were gonna ride off in the sunset together and it was a happy ending I would have been happier if this movie ended and there was no one left the good news for you is if you feel that way you can just keep watching Charles Bronson movies because in every movie just horrible shit happens to that guy and his loved ones (laughs) so like listen this one's a happy ending you want to see some more Charles Bronson turmoil Load another one of his movies. You're going to see it right away. That's all that happens. This is the formula. How about your enjoyability? I, in a weird way, I kind of have like a special place in my heart for this movie because I had been told about this by like a friend before I ever watched it. He basically told me it was ridiculous. I went into it expecting it to be ridiculous. And it was like somehow more ridiculous than I had expected, which is like a, a, a plus for me. You know, normally you go in high expectations and you kind of get let down. I came into this expecting something batshit crazy. And it was like more crazy than I expected. So <laughs> yeah, it, it is f-ing crazy. Yeah, You're right. I have a sentimental yeah. feeling about it. I love Charles Bronson. I f-ing love that man. He's out there. He's a professional. He's trying to be professional. And he's delivering these lines the best way he knows how. And again, he puts the button on it with those one-liners. Ladies first, <laughs> don't f*** with Jack Murphy. Like, those are two great lines. And you know what? I It's hard for me not to like this movie. Um, I'm not insane, so I'm not going to say that it's a 10 or even that it's a 9. But I have this as an 8. I had a good time watching it, and I, and I have watched it before. I probably will watch it again. 
at some point. I'll, I'll just be in the mood of it. You know what? I want something ridiculous. Throw in some Murphy's Law. Let's let Charles Bronson do his thing. Yeah, and that's fair to each their own. I think I was not swept up with the Bronson love. And, and I think the other characters in it, other than the sort of interesting um, female antagonist, were like a letdown to me, I guess. But uh, That's fair. That's, we go. that's fair. Um, what about this beer? I crushed it really fast. We were probably a quarter into our podcast when I was done. <laughs> so really um, strong sort of caramel and malty notes. Um, it reminded me a little bit of drinking chocolate milk almost, right? It had a little bit of a chocolate taste to it too yeah, as I, I went that. through yeah. and add the same smoothness. And so if you're looking for that in a beverage, Murphy's Irish Dead is definitely a good one to drink. Do I care about supporting the Heineken company? Not so much, right? They're yeah. a huge giant beer conglomerate. I'd rather promote some craft beers. But if you're in this small place in Ireland? Yeah. If you want to go to Cork and drink uh, a pint of Murphy's with some of the people there, that would be amazing. I would I would love that experience for sure. I dare say I enjoyed this and I was not expecting to. I was like, oh, f***ing stout, man. Oh, whatever. I'll choke this down. Like, can't be <laughs> beers that I like. I get an some yeah. beers that he will enjoy. But yeah, no, like I, I enjoy this quite a bit. And I think um, nothing against Guinness. Like I'll drink a Guinness. Usually I have, well, I mean, like I'll drink Guinness on St. Patrick's Day the rest of the year. Not so much. <laughs> but I think next St. Patrick's Day, I'll be reaching for some Murphy's instead. <laughs> That's fair. I think it's it's really accessible. I think you could take down a whole bunch of these really fast and then regret it the next day for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. <laughs> well, one thing that we're not going to regret is next week we're going to be dipping back into the audience requests. We're going to be watching Night of the Demon. <laughs> okay. All right. What's this? Well, just to be clear, because there is a movie called Night of the Demons, and there's also a movie called Demons. This is neither of those. Night of the Demon is a movie about, like, um, sort of like a killer Sasquatch. Night of the Demon is about a Sasquatch. I know. It doesn't make a lot of sense. It will probably, uh, I'm sure that'll come up in conversation next week. There's some hilariously, like, I don't want to say graphic parts. It's pretty low budget. There's some blood, obviously, and there's some sexual content. There's some whatever. But, like, it's just ridiculously low budget. And I think it'll be a fun one, whether you've seen the movie or not. This sounds like a motorcycle maniacs kind of uh, vibe to it. You know it. what? I think that's a fair, like, there's, it's going to be, it's, we'll touch on some similar themes, I think, as we get into that one next week. All right. Sounds good. And again, we always love uh, doing requests for our followers on uh, social media. Speaking of which, if you have not already, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the BMB podcast. If you prefer to send us an email, it's the BMB podcast at gmail.com. Yeah. Request there or just slide into our DMs. Either way works. That's going to do it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And we'll see you next time on Bad Movies and Beer. Keep it Murphy. They set him up. He takes them down.